Hello, everybody. My name is Alan, and it's that time once again. Let's talk metal. I may not be talking a huge amount tonight. Uh, my throat's been bothering me a little bit lately, so I'll probably keep this pretty short and straightforward. But I wanted to get a video ready talking about some of the early Chicago heavy metal scene, something I've been wanting to revisit. Some of the early scenes like Cleveland, Texas, Chicago. I've done a Cleveland video previously, and we'll do another hopefully in the not too distant future. But tonight, we're going to turn our attention to Chicago and one of the early compilation albums covering that particular scene. Now, when we think of 1980s Chicago heavy metal, most people, of course, are immediately going to think of the band Trouble. For those who have dug into the Chicago scene a bit more, they'll know that there were a lot of bands operating in a similar style. Pretty heavy, kind of a doomy edge to the music like Trouble had. There are a lot of these groups. War Cry is a very known, well-known one. Battalion, Enforcer. It definitely seemed to be sort of a thing on the Chicago scene. Were these other bands sort of copying what Trouble was doing since they were an early band on the scene that you know had success and got on Metal Blade pretty early? I don't know. Maybe. Maybe it was also just sort of a regional sound that developed. But I'm not going to be talking about any of those bands in particular tonight. Instead, I'm going to be talking about bands featured on a compilation album called Chicago Class of 1985. Right. This is released on Silverfin Records, which was a Chicago area small record label. They only put out about 12 releases, but several of them are, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> again, I'm sorry if my voice is a little off here. Several things on Silverfin are of interest to underground heavy metal collectors. Just reading through the discography here quickly, there's only about 12 items on it. Uh, the first one is something I'm not familiar with called West Side Heat. Then the second one is by a band called Tub Ring. That doesn't sound good. Then you have the Chicago Class of 85 uh, collection. The fourth release is the Paradox Plan of Attack EP, which is a legendary grail item for collectors. We'll talk about in a little bit. We'll come back around to that. Then there was a Chicago Metalworks Battalion Volume 1 compilation and a Chicago Metalworks Battalion Number 2 compilation. Uh, both of those coming out in 1986. Next up is the Hammer-On Nothing to Do But Rock LP. This is another big collectible item uh, that was on Silverfin. Then you have a Chicago Class of 1987 compilation. No, Discogs doesn't have one listed for 1986, so apparently they skipped a year. Then you also have three CD-only releases, Chicago Metalworks Volumes 5, 6, and 7. Now notice I said before you had Volumes 1 and 2 on vinyl, and then 5, 6, and 7 on CD. What about Volumes 3 and 4? That seems to be one of those little details that's gotten overlooked. If they were released, they're not documented on Discogs, and I know other collectors have dug a lot trying to uncover a Volume 3 or a Volume 4. It may just be that those had been planned releases that got scrapped, and so they just kept the numbering going when they finally got Volume 5 out. Weird, but uh, there you have it. Then the 12th and last thing listed for Silverfin Records is the cassette copies of hammer ons nothing to do but rock album so that's it you know small label reportedly you know, run out of a guy's basement quite literally but it did produce several things that are of interest to heavy metal fans so what about this one what's this got on it that's worth our time well we'll work through it i'll zoom in on some band pictures go through some tracks um side a is pretty rough it's barren of any actual heavy material yeah notice too this is just saying chicago class of 85 rock and roll it's not promising to be nothing but metal releases it's not like the other series of compilations on silverfin that were called you know but metal works battalion so we start off with broken heart and that would be these folks here uh with my throat being a little off, I'm going to uh, keep it light on the jokes, but uh, you can insert your own jokes about, uh, you know, this guy and Dockers. Uh, their song is 
if only time could change. <clears throat> it's a pretty straightforward 80s pop song. Uh, next up is Risk, but Risk with a exclamation point at the end. So Risk, um, these guys are also, you know, in very lightweight pop territory. The, the, the picture should tell you that that's not going to be a heavy track whatsoever. Uh, up third, you have 1028 uh, with the numbers all spelled out. That would be this band right here. This one's also, you know, a pop rock song, but it's definitely better than the first two tracks. Um, it's got, you know, pretty good uh, female lead vocals. She's over here. Um, 1028 did release a 12-inch EP uh, a couple of years after this came out. I think it came out in 86. And one of the songs did get a little bit, you know, very minor level of national radio airplay. Never became a hit or anything like that, but... Of all the bands on here, they're probably the one that came the closest to getting some national recognition. So, and you can hear that the the song yeah, it definitely would have worked well for that time. So, decent enough track, not a heavy metal track though. Now, uh, that one track, by the way, is called Shadow. If I forgot to mention it, the Risk song before that was called Baby When Your Love Comes Down. You see song titles like this, and you wonder if you should be buying the compilation. <laughs> All right, up fourth on side A, a uh, band, I think it's pronounced D'Artagnan. Uh, there you go. This guy back here maybe looks like, a, you know, one of the less popular instructors at, uh, you know, Cobra Kai. Just saying. And their song was You Ain't Got It. <clears throat> D'Artagnan ain't got it either. And finally, wrapping out side A, is the band Illicit. So this is Illicit over here, um, mostly female lineup. I think they may have had a male member in their lineup at some point, but they may also have been all female at other times. Uh, Illicit did release a seven-inch single uh, in 1986 called I Won't Sing in My Underwear. Rough name for a song. Um I'm going to guess the idea was they were sort of pushing back against the idea that they had, you know, Prince around in skimpy outfits just because they were a you know female rock band. <clears throat> I don't think the single you know really went anywhere. I've only seen it listed on Discogs. I've never seen a real copy. But uh yeah, they, they did at least you know have a vinyl product of their own put out. And that's where we are at at the side end of side A. So no metal tracks whatsoever on this thing. Bit disappointing so far. Uh, one last bit of trivia: the 1028 EP and the Illicit Seven Inch were released on the same label called Pink Street. So I'm guessing that was, you know, maybe a local or regional sort of pop rock friendly label. Okay, I haven't mentioned a single metal band so far. So why are we covering this compilation? Side Two has a couple of interesting things to offer. Up first is Paradox with a song called Night Rider. Paradox is uh, this bunch. And here right away you can tell, okay, you know, the metal detector is going off. There's a lot of leather jackets, a lot of longer hair. It, of the pictures on the front, this looks like it's going to be the metal band. And you're right. Um, this is you know the heaviest track on the album. Paradox play very straightforward traditional metal, you know, and that, you know, Iron Maiden, Judas Priest, except kind of uh, straightforward, no frills stuff. It's not power metal. It's not thrash. It's not speed. Just, you know, very good, solid metal. Uh, Paradox, as I mentioned when I went through the Silverfin discography, they had a 12-inch EP released on the label in 1985 called Plan of Attack. It's got a pretty striking red cover with the Paradox label on it. It's one of the real holy grail collectible items. The legend has always been, and this has been documented for a long time, so I tend to believe it, that the band went to the pressing plant to pick up copies for their local release party. They grabbed a case of them, which would have been about 50 copies. But when they played it, they weren't at all happy with the way it came out. They didn't think it sounded uh, very good at all. And so they never went back to pick up the rest of the copies. And the plant eventually, you know, Recycled them, junked them, melted them down, and used the vinyl for something else, whatever. As such, 
Reportedly, only about 50 copies ever made it out into the wild. And as such, it's always been you know a very, very rare collector's item. And this is one of those collectibles that's been known for a long time. Yeah, I remember people talking up, you know, Paradox, you know, 20, 25 years ago even. So this isn't some new thing that only got recently discovered. You know, there's Anthology reissue that has the EP plus this track. This track was not on the original EP. So this was a non-EP track. They also had another non-EP track. Um, I don't remember what it was on. But, you know, there was another song also that's on the anthology. The anthology, I think, is six tracks total, four from the EP, one from this compilation, and one from somewhere else. So, yeah, that's the deal on Paradox. Uh, quick side note on it. I had a chance. I was actually offered a copy of the Paradox EP. Uh, Time-wise, I'm pretty sure this was around the holiday season in 2012. I may be slightly off on the timing here. But the bottom line was somebody had a copy for sale. I was contacted because they didn't really want to go through the hassle of eBay if they could help it. And I said, you know, hey, if you want to buy this record, it's in good condition and it's this price and there's absolutely no wiggle room. They, they won't take a dime less. Um, I was, you know, asked for $800 if I wanted to buy the record. And I'll admit I gave it, you know, a little thought, but uh, <laughs> not for long. Um one big sticking point for me, well, there were two. First off, uh, my wife and I, we had either just bought our house or we were getting ready to buy our house. Again, depends when this happened. I'm pretty sure it happened a few months after we got our place in 2012. Yeah, and as such, I was not looking to drop $800 on a record. Is anybody ever looking to drop $800 on a record? <laughs> I don't know. Um but, you know, I knew this record. I knew this was insanely rare. I knew this was the kind of thing you might not have another chance to buy. So I did at least sleep on it for a night. But, you know, the second reason I went ahead and walked away from it was that it did not have its insert with it. Yes, the Paradox 12-inch EP is supposed to come with an insert. I don't know what's on the insert. I've never seen it. I don't know if it's lyrics, credits, pictures, or what. You know, but when I checked back with them, like, does this copy have the insert with it? And they said, Flout, no, it is missing its insert. And I was like, okay, uh, that's enough of that. I'm not going to entertain paying $800 for a quote-unquote incomplete copy. Now, in hindsight, the record you know, goes for a lot more than that these days. Pretty soon after that, uh, a copy, and it may have been the same copy, was sold on eBay for over $2,000. That amount was staggering at the time. Folks had a hard time believing it sold for that much. It's easy to look back and think to myself, oh, geez, I guess I should have bought it because it was worth a lot more. Nobody, when I was priced that record for $800, that would have been a very, you know, quote unquote, fair price to sell a copy for. So again, it wasn't until, you know, a little bit after that where copies started going for thousands of dollars a piece. Is it worth it? Well, I mean, that's up to you. It's hard to say any record's worth that. I've heard the EP, you know, it's good, standard, straightforward, straightforward, traditional heavy metal. I don't think it's the most outstanding release of its era. There's a lot of records I like a lot better than that. I'll put it this way. If I was going to pay $800 or $2,000 for a heavy metal record, Paradox would not be the one I would put the money down for. But that's just me. It is an insanely rare record nonetheless. And it's our first heavy entry, getting back to our Chicago Class of 85 comp. All right, second track on side B is by a band called Tough Love. The song is called RLTS. I don't know what it means. Let's find Tough Love on the cover. This is another group that was uh, mostly or all female in the lineup. I think they had a male member for at least a period of time. Uh, Tough Love did have a couple of releases. They had a single that had come out the year before in 84, and they had a cassette-only release that would come out in 86 or 87. I think they had three songs on the cassette. Uh, Tough Love <clears throat> is sort of borderline metal. Their style reminds me a little bit of the 
band Ransom, the Christian heavy metal band, if folks are familiar with that. Um, good female vocals, you know, a little stronger, slightly heavier sound, but still pretty accessible, kind of, you know, right there in between the rock and uh, metal uh, bridge somewhere. I'll go ahead and call it metal for our purposes here. Pretty decent track for that style. And having two other releases makes Tough Love the most prolific band on this entire compilation. So we're definitely dealing with, you know, small bands here that did not get to go very far. All right, third on track B, we stay in the middle zone for a third track running with the band Hammer On doing a song called Marching Off to War. Promising song title. Band picture here. Yeah. Amron, kind of a very mixed bag. Pretty sure the guy borrowed that scarf from uh, the dude over here in D'Artagnan, maybe. Yeah, mm -hmm. just saying. Maybe sharing a wardrobe there. Don't know. Anyway, the Amron track is an okay metal track. I don't think it's amazing by any standard. Some people really get into the band, and that's cool. The band did release a full album that I mentioned on the Silverfin discography earlier. It's called Nothing to Do But Rock. It's another one that sells for you know several hundred dollars at least on the occasions it shows up. Hammeron's big claim to fame is that they feature Jeff Ward in the band. Jeff Ward would go on to work with both Ministry and Nine Inch Nails before committing suicide in 1993. So <clears throat> fans of those bands are sometimes drawn to this compilation if they're trying to be a very completist about their ministry or Nine Inch Nails collection. So another connection there. Um, the Nothing to Do But Rock album has a lot of fans. A lot of folks do think that one's pretty good. I haven't heard it in a long time. I remember thinking it was decent, but was never one that I would have put on a want list thinking like, oh yeah, I'd be willing to pay $300, $400 for that. No, no, not for me. Um, they did release an album around 2014. Let me check the title of that. I've never heard this one, but in checking things out for this video, yeah, they did an album called Wired for Sound in 2014. Don't know anything about it. Shows up on the Metal Archives. If you're interested, you can check it out there. Yeah, the only other thing to point out about Hammeron is they did have several members that did work with other quote unquote name acts uh let's see mick vega played with damian thorne at one point uh brian trox uh played with snow white the snow white one begins with a z and it also worked with cyclone temple at one point so yeah, this was definitely the band where members went on and were involved in the most other projects i guess you'd say you know, these guys were the most successful at least in terms of having more output with more bands over time, even though Hammer-On didn't have a lot of material themselves. All right, so, so far, Side B, we've at least got three interesting metal tracks. The last two, unfortunately, kind of go back to pop territory. Uh, track number four, Person to Person, Deliver Don't Say Goodbye. Uh, person to Person, here we go. Um... They, they, some of these bands weren't real coordinated on their fashion sense. <laughs> Members were really trying to go in some very different directions. Didn't really have a core identity they were looking for there. And person, person, it's an okay, fairly catchy kind of pop song. Uh, not, not terrible, but uh, not amazing. They did release an album in 1983, which makes them one of only two bands on this compilation that had any material released before this compilation came out. Tough Love had uh, the single in 84. And Person to Person had an album in 83. The album, a little confusingly, has uh, one of the band member names on the cover also. So it kind of looks like the album is by a guy called Don Peterson, and the album is titled Person to Person. But actually, the album is by Person to Person, the band, and is simply entitled Person to Person, and for reasons, Don Peterson has his name in the lower er, left-hand corner of the cover. Kind of strange. Uh, I'm guessing, I don't know, maybe he's the one who put the cover design together. Maybe it was 
at the point where it's going to break off and be a solo project. I don't know. Kind of a weird deal. But uh, it is listed and you can see pictures of it online. Finally, rounding things out, we have a group called the Griff Band. The Griff Band is uh, this group here. Um, they are at least going for sort of a tougher looking image. You might glance at this and think, okay, maybe this is something a little more rough and tumble. It's an instrumental track with an awful lot of piano. I, I'm, I've never really known why bands, when they get the chance to appear on a compilation, contribute an instrumental. Seems like you're not really showing off your best material. I guess unless you're an all-instrumental band, in which case, there you go. Uh, the Griff Band has no other notes uh, that I've noticed online. So at the end of the day, the uh, Chicago class of 85 <clears throat> doesn't exactly pass with flying colors. I guess we'll let them through their senior year with something like a C minus. You do get what was you know, an exclusive paradox track and an exclusive hammer on track. Those were the big draws for this compilation album for a long time. And again, I'll, I'll give tough love credit. That's a solid enough song. Uh, it's not going to be for everybody, but we'll say that uh, you know, you've know you got three metal tracks out of 10 songs, and among the others, whether you want to call them AOR, New Wave, Pop, whatever, there are at least a couple that are you know decent. There's nothing on it that is actually cringy bad, just you know really horrible amateur hour bad stuff. And the bands, you know, were all at least functional, but... Uh, whether the compilations of interest to metal collectors, it really comes down to those three tracks, I think. Paradox, Tough Love, and Hammer On. So yeah, kind of a weird you know, glance into the Chicago scene, but I think, again, it's showcasing a little bit more of the rock side of the scene, less of the metal side. Um, interestingly, while there are some metal bands here, none of them are in that Trouble, War Cry, Enforcer Battalion kind of vein whatsoever. Paradox... Uh, hammer on tough love they don't sound like that not in that style at all so yeah i don't think it's a particularly representative album of chicago's heavy metal sound but it does have some cool tracks by some obscure bands and you get a glimpse into what was also happening on the lighter end of things so that is going to do it for this particular video in another video hopefully where my throat's not bothering me so much we might revisit the Chicago scene and check out some of those other compilations like the you know, Battalion Metalworks volumes, which uh, reportedly have a much heavier roster of bands. But we'll have to wait and check that out some other time. So now let's talk metal in the comments down below. Uh, these kind of compilations where there's only maybe a couple of metal bands on them, um, do those interest you or do you avoid them? unless it's you know, a completely solid metal front-to-back compilation. Do you have any of these where there's maybe only one or two metal bands on the compilation, but there's a couple of really good tracks, some hidden gems on there? There are some compilations like that floating around that I'll talk about at other times. Even some new wave of British heavy metal comps were that way, where they'd have a lot of reggae and you know, you know pop and synth stuff, but then they'd have one or two hidden you know, new wave of British heavy metal gems on them. If you know some compilations like that, that people should check out or at least go hunt down that one song to hear, leave a comment down below and uh, tell folks where they should go look. All right, that is going to do it for this video. Until next time, everybody take care. And as always, keep banging your head, even if you can only bang it to three of the bands on this particular compilation. <laughs>